We are delighted to welcome you to our Horizon Connect series, iBooks Author for Advanced Users and Projects. I'm your host today, Holly Ludgate, Senior Director of Program Development for the NMC. First, we have Dr. Kyle Dixon. Kyle is an Associate Professor of English at Abilene Christian, where since 2005, he's been working on mobile media projects and the humanities. Since 2011, he's directed the AT&T Learning Studio. We also have Nathan Driscoll, who is a designer and filmmaker. In 2011, he was a guest lecturer on interactive media at Abilene Christian, and he spent the last six years exploring design and user experience for museums and educational institutions. Matthew Bardwell has a degree in radio, television, and video production. He also has 12 years experience of working on TV, radio broadcasting, and video production, and has started his work with ACU over four years ago. So let's just go ahead and jump in. Many of us in, in uh, the 80s and 90s kind of cut our teeth in an era that came to be known as the kind of desktop publishing revolution. Um, so these are tools that are pretty familiar to you from, uh, say, like the 1985 Laser Writer, um, from the first era, kind of classic Macintosh. Um, and those tools, uh, coupled together with um, an interface that will look familiar to some, this is the first version of Aldous PageMaker, uh, brought kind of advanced publishing capabilities to a wide audience in, in a lot of ways for the first time. Um, it was a it was a perfect storm with hardware and software kind of bringing low cost custom publication of everything from documents and newsletters to flyers at what we all remember as just a mesmerizing 300 DPI, right? Um, how in the world could could uh, technology bring us anything greater at that moment? Um, so to help us kind of situate this group up front, I think Holly's going to throw in a, a poll just to to try to remember what were some of the first publishing and interactive applications you remember using. And uh, and, and so this is, you know, like any good uh, technology pr presentation, uh, looking boldly forward, we want to begin with nostalgia. Okay, so we've got a number of you jumping in, and then uh, Holly, if you've got the, the oldest page maker poll, I'll let you throw that in at, uh, at your leisure. Great. So these tools um, they kind of remind us of an era where technology was bringing kind of unprecedented, uh, unprecedented capabilities, uh, publishing capabilities, and was putting it in the hands of mere mortals. Um, at its worst, sometimes, uh, this produced some really, just truly heinous design, right? We all remember being a part of a generation that believed outline was uh, a typographical style. Uh, but in the hands of professionals, uh, these tools really did transform the newsrooms, the magazines, advertising and mar marketing agencies around the world. And then the true revolution kicked in when desktop publishing really was raising the level of work from pre-professionals and from non-professionals. It was kind of transforming the way education was done in university departments. Um, even I was a high school yearbook teacher in, in almost another life ago. And you, to, to really see the way those students took to uh, capabilities like those early generations of PageMaker and the, the power it put in their hands. Um, the, the one challenge for those of us that really were, that, that started with those capabilities and are, have come of age with those tools is to remain a little stuck in uh, seeing the world through the lens of those first capabilities. It's, it's you know, easy for all of us to kind of feel a little blinded, uh, bringing the lenses of kind of past capability or design and applying them to um, the present. So you remember whether it's the first versions of the iPhone, the first versions of the iPad, those questions of, so how will it help me do the things I used to do on a laptop, right? Which is an entirely understandable question, but also a question that foreshortens the transformative nature of these new tools, okay? So what we wanted to do is, um, we have some, some uh, initial numbers from, from the initial poll. Okay. 
Okay, so if you've got the ability to uh, to kick in and tell us, uh, Holly, if that's live, what publishing and interactive applications you remember using, and we'll show some of those re results in a minute. No problem. Uh, but but these kinds of questions um, really put us back into the mind yeah, of uh, this this more recent era. Okay, so many of you remember early in January, maybe. Uh, of this year where you were when iBooks Author was released. And and for lots of us personally, and for lots of us in, in uh, education, the comparisons with these earlier revolutionary um, tools that brought powerful hardware with completely new ways to think about software were, were obvious and instantaneous. Um, so the new publishing capabilities, connecting novices and advanced users with a global audience, felt familiar, okay? Most of us may very well have downloaded iBooks Author in that very first 24 hours or that first couple days just to kick the tires. We remember swiping through the pages of the kind of early samples from McGraw-Hill and Pearson and others, and it was exhilarating, right? These capabilities, I know how to create a keynote, so therefore I know how to create interactive text. Um, those cap capabilities in many ways changed the landscape or promised to. Uh, and so some of what we are wanting to do, I think, in this presentation is to, to walk through kind of where does the rhetoric meet the reality, and are we, is, is iBooks author, um, is this kind of new era of interactive productivity tools or publication tools um, kind of a next wave, a, a kind of a revolutionary moment, okay? Um, let's Go ahead, Holly. Let's go ahead and skip past the next poll, and we'll um, we'll jump immediately to some context around um, kind of who we are. Uh, so, for anybody that's had a chance to look at the year one report, uh, whether you looked at that in the in the PDF light version or in the full on uh, iBooks uh, publication, you know that AT the at and Learning Studio uh, opened here at ACU in 2011. Some of you were on campus at a mobile conference we were holding last, uh, a year ago, February. Uh, and so it's been a busy first year. Um, in, in many ways, the, the, the types of things going on up here in the Learning Studio um, are a natural iteration of projects that, that we've watched happening and kind of um, developing in our interactions with NMC members since at least my first NMC conference at Princeton in 2008. And so there, I think for NMC members and for many of your member universities, there's a lot, a great deal in the, in the learning studio that will feel familiar, that will feel like it's jointly owned. Um, that same year in 2008 was the first year that AT&T uh, stepped into um, the mobile connected campus experiment, bringing iPhones and iPods, um, as well as kind of new mobile portals, uh, mobile polling tools, and uh, podcasting programs um, kind of into the Center for Teaching and Learning and, and trying to look at those in some detail. Uh, it really was the growing interest in media production um, produced by or kind of sparked by the new mobile media devices that are always kind of on us, always with us, um, that led to, I think, the focus development of the Learning Studio. Um, so last spring, we began a discussion um, about a need on campus and, and, you know, for us off campus. Uh, to develop an annual report, just to be able to introduce some of the core values of the Learning Studio and share some of the stories from our first year, statistics about um, usage and a, and a number of other things that would be um, important for us to kind of broadcast to a number of constituencies. The audience um, included uh, corporate collaborators at AT&T and elsewhere. Uh, faculty and students at ACU that were still scratching their heads, some of them, and asking who we are and kind of what we represent, uh, as well as administrators and external grant uh, agencies that are, are, you know, continuing to be a part of our funding future. So given the amount of media content we worked on in year one, uh, we wanted to select a platform that would showcase just a range of content types. Um, but that would also allow us um, to experiment with a, with a 1.0 product to see 
what so was it really capable um, what it was really capable of in kind of work a day uh, conditions um, Holly if you want to go ahead and pull up the chapter two video here so we, we wanted the, the annual report to be able to accomplish a number of key objectives. Um, it needed to provide an external audiences a glimpse of the facility, folks that couldn't make their way to Abilene um, to, to be able to explore the design of the space themselves. Um, we wanted the opportunity to blend stories from the first year with usage data on uh, how the space was being utilized how checkout equipment and other kinds of capabilities were being leveraged. Uh, and then we wanted to establish an image of the learning studio as a center of experimentation, Welcome collaboration. Welcome to the next expertise. unit in Introduction to Art. Brave this is our friend world. Dan McGregor. Now, he's a, I a really kind creative of awkward art and design to uh, faculty in member of a that um, and also, if you probably kind of walked into me, us and says, it looks like you know, I've always wanted to be on world. a green screen. And so, this, it kind of illustrates one final key objective for us in uh, the facility, which was to showcase the breadth of involvement in year one that we were getting from just energetic faculty members and, st and students from across campus. Um, in a nutshell, we wanted the, the year one report to kind of help share the stage, uh, to tell their stories as much as we were telling our story. What I'd like to do is to uh, transition here. We're going to introduce you to uh, Nathan and uh, Matt, Matt Bardwell and Nathan Driscoll, you've, you've heard their introductions a second, a second ago. And I'd like to them, for them to have some opportunities to walk through, um, so what was the experience like? A several month long project, um, you know, pretty significant in the life of, of our facility, um, but certainly an opportunity to see um, the full breadth of what does iBooks author look like in a, a professional workflow? Okay, and I think they've got some things, uh, hopefully, that can engage a variety of questions, um, you know, across this audience. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Nathan, and Matt's sitting here with me. And uh, I just want to start by kind of talking about why make an iBook in the first place. Uh, for us, it was, I mean, a fairly easy question, as should be obvious by now. The Learning Studio has kind of revolved um, in its first year around encouraging and facilitating the creation of media. And so to have a platform like this that is uh, able to present media in such a um, rich, such a dynamic way, such an intuitive way on a pretty widely available platform, especially for a school like ours uh, where iPads are pretty prevalent, this just seemed um, like a really intriguing kind of project and one that once we started talking about it initially, we just kind of looked at each other and said, well, we've got to try it, um, especially because it was brand new and uh, we were always kind of looking for ways to innovate around what we do. So it was a pretty, um, pretty simple answer to that question, why make an iBook. The advantage we have from the beginning, too, is that the Learning Studio, since it began, has been involved in creating this kind of dynamic content, videos, et cetera, and so, um, for example, the 15 or so films uh, that you see included in the book, only one of those was actually from an outside source, and that was the Film Fest film that you'll see on the, um, in the second chapter. And even many of the photos in, that in, were included were either images I or Kyle took, or they were pulled from a ACU's Creative Services Archive. And so, obviously, one thing to keep in mind as you start pulling in all this content is um, to make sure permissions are squared away, to make sure we we give credit where credit is due, that we have rights for the, the images and content we use. Um, I'll just say, too, I couldn't begin uh, to run through everything we learned along the way designing this book. It was a months long process. So from the start, I'll say this will be very informal, and we may you know, pause from time to time. Um, if there are any questions, we may just uh, save that, to, of course, for the Q&A at the end. Um, I started out in publication design um, from the start of my career and so I approached this project kind of like I would approach a magazine project and it is in very way, in, in a lot of ways very similar um, but again iBooks author can do things that um, you know no other uh, program really has been able to accomplish and so you kind of have to think about how the user will interpret and, and interact with what you're doing. Um, for iBooks author for us some of the strengths obviously the price was right. Um, 
this is a free program. So anybody with a you know an up to date Mac, assuming you have the right OS and everything, um, you can jump right in on it and just play around, which I would say is one of the best ways to learn anything. And the price for playing in this case is nothing. So uh, that was awesome, and actually it, it ensures that you know almost every teacher that we have here on campus who is interested in this can take part immediately. Um, also, this is obviously a significant leap beyond PDF, beyond any kind of sort of um, things we've distributed over mobile devices. It's in many ways, I guess, the closest uh, parallel we can draw is to the web itself, just the kind of uh, linked, interactive, um, you know, rich environment. Uh, Another thing that can't be overlooked is that we really had confidence, obviously, in the future of the platform because uh, it's regardless of what you think of Apple, um, whether you're a fan or you just rolled your eyes when I asked that question, um, you can't deny that a, a software platform built by the world's best technology firm, the most successful <laughs> technology company, is going to improve over time, that it's going to have some longevity in the market that um, even some of the issues that we may address today in a year or two may be ironed out, you know, because, um, it, it, and that's pretty self-evident, but it can't be overlooked again as a uh, legitimate uh, strength of iBooks Author. Some of the concerns, and there were many, um, we've outlined a few here of our top concerns. It, obviously, it's an iPad-only audience, and to many, uh, you know, if it, if it weren't for ACU having such a, uh, iOS friendly culture here. There's lots of iOS devices floating around. We might not have been as uh, as anxious to take this on, um, but as it is, that was a minor concern of ours. But it may be a major concern for some of the other um, uh, some of you out there who are tackling the same type of uh, project. It requires a Mac to author, so if you do not have a Mac, <laughs> uh, you're up a creek. And uh, that's Apple's friendly way of just uh, <laughs> taking your money. Um, the first iteration of the software is something else. I mean, this was the first, uh, the first time anybody had seen this. There was not a lot of, uh, there, there was some, um, you know, there were some resources out there, some people talking about it in forums and such, but really the uh, knowledge base was not as large as it might be for some other uh, programs that we use. So. Um, that was an adventure. Sometimes it just meant, like I said, playing around and being willing to experiment and uh, and sometimes hack the system, so to speak. And the thing about Apple, and especially this program, as we all know, they have a, a sort of tendency to create these kind of closed systems to, where everyone does things in the way they expect and uh, maybe not in the way the user would like. And so sometimes it's actually intriguing to figure out ways that you can hack the system um, because it's intriguingly, even in the midst of its kind of closed nature, it's intriguingly open. There are some things that you can uh, you can find a back door into and we'll get to some of those, some cool things that we figured out. Um, one of those, for instance, and I don't have a slide here to illustrate, but if you've downloaded the book, you know, even on the first page um, where we have um, Thomas Edison's laboratory. This is an example of something that, uh, if you expand that photo, um, it actually become it's a gallery. Um, but galleries as they are, are, uh, sorry. Sorry, I'm getting a note here. <laughs> All right. But we didn't actually use it as a gallery. We stuck a gallery in and uh, let the caption bleed off the page. And so when you tap that, it's a tappable, um, expandable image. And that wasn't something that was, you know, readily um, obvious in the software. It's something we found out by playing. And so that's important. I'm going to go here to uh, the file size. We noticed right off the bat, as soon as Apple introduced textbooks, is that um, some of these textbooks are very large. Um, this one, for instance, right here, 2.77 gigabytes. And on a 15 gigabyte, 16 gigabyte device, uh, that's nothing to sneeze at. So these were just, uh, you know, some questions we were asking ourselves as we went along. And so I kind of want to turn this over to you guys and say, uh, from your own initial look at iBooks Author, are there any um, significant pros and cons that you think educators should weigh carefully? And feel free to weigh in in the chat. Um, and begin each line with pro or con. 
And we'll take a minute to kind of let you uh, consider that. And we'll come back to that and, uh, and maybe show the results up above. From the beginning, we wanted to develop a, a clear plan for moving forward. Um, you know, we ask questions, um, book versus magazine style. We've all, we're familiar with the book style. Um, we've read iBooks before in uh, traditional formats. Um, a magazine style, like we've seen from, uh, like we'll reference again later on, Michigan State uh, was one of the early ones we saw. Their annual report was done um, in iBooks author, and it looked very familiar, like a magazine. Um, the same, you know, the variety between pages, strong emphasis on images and uh, page flow. And this was, I guess, the most intriguing thing for me. Um, and also maybe just the most fun to read, which is important. And we wanted to also identify strong existing content. So as much as we could um, pull from articles we've written in the past or, uh, you know, any sort of resource, uh, photography, et cetera, like the photos of the space that you'll see introducing each chapter um, were taken by a very good photographer. Those were from ACU's Creative Services Archive, um, and we were able to get permission to use those. Uh, we also created an extensive timeline for new content production. So as we talked about what we wanted to accomplish with this project, we actually sat down on a huge whiteboard, uh, covered the whiteboard with every piece of content that we would create. This was the day one, what we did every piece of content that we were going to create, and then what order we were going to accomplish those in. And you have to kind of break it into many projects. For, for something of this scale, that's, that's really what it took, was looking at the long term and then um, kind of, you know, week by week, uh, month by month, what would we accomplish when, what needed to come before what. All of that's um, obviously an importance, uh, important considerations. We had a couple of... Um, you have a couple of choices right off the bat in iBooks Author. So they hold you to their, uh, I guess it's six templates, and that shouldn't be construed as a uh, restriction against, you know, kind of going your own route. What that means is you just start with um, their suggestions, their design suggestions, which for a lot of you, if you don't have a design background or who may be uh, just interested in doing smaller projects, this could be a great choice. It, it allows you to kind of get in and start working without a whole lot of fuss. I'll share something really quick, a, a pretty invaluable resource. There, I was about two months in before I figured this out, and so <laughs> my pain is your gain in this case. You'll, you'll notice um, when you open a template up for the first time, there are these kind of static elements that don't move. And as part of the template, it's your natural assumption to assume that that's just the way it is. That was my assumption. I actually, you know, little rule lines that might go down the middle of the page to separate columns, things like that. And uh, it was pretty frustrating to, to, I was actually like covering those, you know, with rectangles, like just to mask them out, uh, et cetera. And uh, so really quickly, all you have to do if you run up against this, um, the items that are actually immovable that have little X's instead of handles, select those template items and uh, under the arrange uh, menu option, it's just as simple as going to arrange unlock. And once I figured that out, and several hacks like that, it just made my, made my life so much easier. And again, um, made me really wish for a broader knowledge base that, that more people talking about this stuff, because I could have figured that out a lot much sooner. So, um, but basic orientation choices also, you know, you can do, uh, we, we chose not to in the end, um, but it is possible to have a book that rotates with the uh, orientation of the iPad so that People who are more long-form readers just want to sit and read text and get the images and the dynamic content out of the way can do that. Um, for various reasons, we decided that it was better for us to do um, horizontal only. It worked for us. It's, uh, it's more, this was more focused on dynamic content anyway. The text was a secondary element. And also, there's some customizability issues with um, the way captions would translate from horizontal orientation to vertical orientation. These kinds of things are, are issues that you'll figure out as you experiment with your own projects, but I'll just go ahead and leave it at that. In the end, we decided um, to do basic uh, uh, horizontal orientation. That also allowed us to do things like drop caps on the, on the pages that you'll see that on. 
Um, and we evaluated several widget options, and obviously there's some intriguing possibilities there. And then internal versus embedded media, meaning um, do we link, and I guess the, the question here was, do we link outward to, um, to linked videos from the web, or do we keep everything enclosed in this one uh, file so that you could you know, view it offline on an airplane or something like that? In the end, that's the decision we made, was to have everything embedded inside the book, and um, it, in, in, as far as the interactivity goes, that just um, we noticed that was the most seamless process for the user too. That they were able to watch uh, videos and such uh, much more intuitively. And if you had a video, for instance, embedded from outside and you swiped through to further chapters uh, and came back, it would basically pick up where you left off for HTML5 videos. And so that didn't really uh, work the way we wanted. And uh, but you know, overall, questions to consider. Everyone's going to do this differently. We went through, uh, we, we had to talk about how much time do we invest in each stage of the project, charts and widgets, etc. And we do want this to look beautiful. And we do lean more towards quality um, and, and doing things right. but. You know, that's an ever-present question for all of us in big projects like this, is how much is a good investment of time? Um, we found handy hacks along the way. Uh, you're actually able to directly copy and paste Illustrator vectors. So I work in Adobe Illustrator for most of the graphics in this iBook. Um, they were actually pasted. I, I copied them directly from my Adobe Illustrator artboard. You know, Command C went into iBook's author, Command B pasted it in, and it pastes as a scalable vector on the page, which was, uh, I found actually even possible in site keynote. So some of you probably already know that, but for me it was like, oh, wow. Um, so that was kind of fun. The, the fun part of this was getting to find these kind of um, hacked ways of doing things. This was another thing we found that was pretty interesting. This is an iBooks author related as far as, as much as it is just a cool and useful resource. Um, this was actually a font called FF Chartwell and designed by, oh, I'm going to forget his name, Travis is his first name, but uh, very ingenious in that it actually uses, you'll see the numbers up there, it uses open type, and the numbers you see, the 5 plus 12 plus 17 plus 66, that's with open type turned off, with ligatures deactivated, so that's what you actually type in. And as soon as you, and those of you who use programs like Illustrator or InDesign will explain, will understand what I mean by ligatures and open type. If you don't, don't worry. This is just a handy tip for some of us. Um, but a program that has ligatures, you actually just seamlessly convert these uh, rows of numbers into instant charts and diagrams. And you'll see you can even use letters like A over there at the end to, to create punches. Um, A through Z creates different size punches. This is just like a cool little uh, trick. You'll see we use that on uh, page 26 and even uh, I think page 25 and all the um, the little charts, like that one running behind, showing the, the checkouts per month since we opened. Just a nice little addition. And it also makes a nice font. All the numbers that you see, the numerals on that page, are written with uh, Chartwell's proprietary uh, font. I'm going to hand it over to Matt here. And he's actually going to talk a little bit about the virtual tour. And I think we're going to. Um, Sure. Toss the video, toss it back to Holly real quick, if you could, Holly, and show that. Uh, chapter three. Chapter three. Uh, yeah, the chapter three video. This is Matt Bardwell, by the way. One of the things that we wanted to create, Kyle asked me if we'd be able to figure out a way to create a virtual tour of the learning studio so that uh, people can see what our space looks like. And uh, I said, okay, I would absolutely love to figure that out. And this was. The majority of my time spent um, on this iBook was working on this project. Um, each of these rooms took about 15 to 20 pictures. And I can uh, quickly uh, tell you which programs I used to uh, get this project done. To actually stitch all the pictures together, the 15 to 20 pictures, I used a program called PT GUI. And uh, that the web address for that software is ptgui.com. And then to actually create the panoramic movements and add that map that you saw on the screen, 
is a was made with a program called Pano 2 VR, and that is actually put together by a company called Garden Gnome Software. And those those two pieces of software made this uh, project not easy to complete, but uh, made it possible for us to show people what our uh, learning studio looks like who wouldn't be able to make the trip here to Abilene to uh, get that done. One of the tools that uh, Nathan actually used, there's a, another interactive inside the, the our iBook uh, that was made with Tumult Hype. And I would say that it, it did easily create an HTML5 widget, but creating the widget inside of Tumult took some some work and to make it look pretty and, and Nathan spent some time on that but we were able to export a widget um, HTML5 widget so we could put it directly into the iBook and that was very helpful for just creating a, a nice really nice interactive and one of the other things that we want to mention about HTML5 widgets is you can go to class widgets to find um, widgets that you can put into your iBook and we actually did try that out when we were um, debating whether to do embedded videos in our iBook or actually have um, our videos linking to our outside server. The reason why we were thinking about the outside server was because of size issues. Um, when we linked everything out to the HTML or to our uh, our servers, the book size like dropped by 70%. But we decided that the user interface and how the user experienced the book, it was worth uh, raising the, the size of the book. Um, I think the, the, end, the end size of our book is about 450 megabytes. And when you compare that to the other book that we showed you earlier, that's uh, quite a bit smaller. And, um, and actually downloading it through the iBook store made it very easy. And um, I think that's the last thing. I want to, I'll throw it back to Nathan here. As you can see, my my major time was spent on that virtual tour and working with videos. So, one more thing, I just got a note. Um, one of the major things that caused us a hiccup in creating this iBook was actually the putting the videos and converting them for use into the iBook. Um, one of the programs that I would always use to convert videos is um, Handbrake, and that converts uh, M. M4V files that work in iTunes. So I figured, you know, that's going to work in here. But they actually, iBooks author would not accept these files. And we figured out that you actually have to convert the video files inside of QuickTime to get that done. And so we figured that out. We got it in there. And um, Nathan's going to talk about some of the issues that we had distributing the product here in a little bit. But we found out that the reason why we're having issues and caused us a two week delay was because of one video file that was uh, converted the wrong way. And the the problem was I converted one of them as a 720p file, but what you have to do is convert it as an iPhone file. You have to go down to export in QuickTime and set as I want this to be for an iPhone or an iPod. And that was the only way that it would work correctly inside of our, our iBook. And so here is Nathan again. He's going to finish this up. Yeah, thanks, Matt. And again, like like I said before, this is an ever-changing landscape. You know, some of the, uh, the fixes that are necessary now may not be necessary tomorrow. And even some of our own experience should not be considered, um, you, you know, um, doctrine. It's it's definitely possible, but other people find other ways to do things that we did, but uh, we tried a lot of things. We've, we've gotten really familiar with this program, so we'll offer you what we can. Um, and yeah, like Matt said, one video tripped us up, um, and it's kind of ridiculous. What I have to warn you about that we'll come to at the end is that publishing is not as easy as the creation process. <laughs> And that's putting it mildly, maybe as mildly as it could possibly be put, <laughs> but we'll get to that. Um, another hack here you'll see at the bottom, uh, custom poster images and play buttons. So it turns out that for videos that you embed in the pages, um, you'll see this on page 16 of the iBook, and uh, there's also on the LS Unboxed. 
post on Box page that uh, it's actually possible to create a poster frame for a video that is not actually taken from the video itself. In this case, this was a video frame that we actually took into Photoshop and masked out every all the background and uh, the floor around the carpet. And we were able to then overlay the, a transparent PNG as a poster frame for the video, the playable video, uh, inside the layout in a way that let it overlap uh, kind of the textured background in that top bar. You'll see his head overlaps. Little things like this helped us immensely in just giving us freedom to design uh, the way we wanted. And this is invaluable. We actually, I think, got this concept from the E.O. Wilson sample book that was put out when iBooks Author was released and when the textbook initiative was uh, launched. And they had done something similar to this. Y'all might be familiar with it already, but just these nice little alternative ways of adding video to a spread and making it just kind of more interesting and more fun to play with. Uh, publishing. This was a, a hassle that none of us anticipated. Uh, publishing is done, uh, I, I've never actually published anything to the App Store. I think it's done in much the same way as that with the uh, iTunes publisher, the app, and you sign up as a developer. Uh, we were using a free account, so we weren't charging for this book, obviously. Um, but at first, before all that, we decided that it might be possible to just share uh, the book over a network from a, a downloadable link like we had seen before. The problem with that became very quickly that at the beginning that works. When you're sharing proofs and you have two or three or ten pages even, uh, that works. And once you get to 20 or 30 pages, if you tap the link, uh, inside the web browser to download the iBook like we from our uh, from our server your iPad sits there and does nothing no progress bar no indicators that it's actually downloading and it takes you know maybe upwards of 20 minutes sometimes to actually download the book and you just expect your users to sit there and hope for the best and wait during that time um, but actually that's I was surprised at what a terrible way that was to distribute um, it just, especially for a larger book, you have to have it. Um, I, I would say right now, the the only way to distribute a book that that large that I would consider is from the iBook store, because it's just a much more intuitive experience. And so that's what we did. But getting there wasn't so easy. Um, I'm going to go to the next spread here. Um, you'll see that I have two screen caps here, and I'm going to explain them. But inside iTunes Publisher. We went through and uploaded our iBook when we were all ready, and we got this uh, pop-up notice on the left. Your delivery was successful. Your book will be available for free in all iBooks or markets. This is sounding great so far. To adjust your book clearances, go to Manage Your Books and iTunes Connect. We hit OK. Our iBook is ready, but it wasn't. Um, in iTunes Connect, no book showed up. Uh, we had never done this before. We're not developers, engineers. Like I said, we hadn't done app development or any of that. So we assumed that we were waiting on Apple when actually Apple had never received our book. Even though we'd gotten the success message, Apple had never received it. And on the, on the right here, you'll see how we figured that out finally. I believe we, uh, it's an, uh, file, it may be a file uh, menu option inside of iTunes Publisher. There aren't many options. This one was fetch status, uh, I, I believe. And we actually had to type in our ISBN, our vendor ID, and then pull the status from Apple's uh, records. And there we found what you're seeing here. Our uploads had failed. The import hadn't occurred. Apple had never received the actual content. And we didn't know why. Uh, that was maybe the worst part, that there were no indicators of what might have caused this. And in scrounging through, um, you know, pages and pages of forum discussions, uh, we eventually realized that uh, it must have been an issue with videos. Now, we had, like I said before, 15, 16 videos in the project, and so to sort out which one that was would have taken, you know, effectively 10 or 15 uploads, uh, trying over and over again. We were able to luckily um, 
I think Matt was actually the one who deduced which video it was specifically. And guys, this is an issue that we had. You may have a different issue, but it's important to remember that do not assume at this point uh, in the process, at, at this date, don't assume when you get this successful delivery message that it was actually successful. And actually look in iTunes Connect, and if you do not see a book there to manage or to uh, check on the status of, if there's nothing in iTunes Connect when you log in, then there's a problem. And uh, just know what to look for. And uh, another problem was once the book is actually uploaded to the iBook store, the publisher actually has no control over when that actually gets published. And so from the beginning in forums, I was seeing people report anywhere from five to 13 days to three months. And it didn't seem to be predictable in any way, shape, or form. And we were worried about that. And the best, I can, the best advice I can give you is to allow plenty of time for publishing. And if you get stuck and you get in a bind and you really need help, I would, uh, you can actually contact the iBookstore support at iBookstore at apple.com, which is what we ended up doing. After several back and forths, we were able to get some uh, good assistance from them. And um, so we got the book published, which was a huge relief. We actually also, I'll, I'll say this, as a final publishing consideration, um, we knew that not everybody looking at this was going to be able to um, view it on an iPad. That was our primary consideration during the, during the whole design process. We really wanted people to view our work in the way it was meant to be viewed. Um, but we did create an alternate version. Some of you may have actually downloaded that and looked at it. And you'll notice on the light version, the PDF version, we threw in um, indicators on every piece of dynamic content that said to experience this content, download the full interactive version in the Apple iBook store. So this was just our kind of friendly nudge to say, we hope you enjoy this, and if you really want to enjoy it, <laughs> um, go ahead and check it out. Uh, some resources that are going to be really helpful for those of you just getting into the program, which looked like there were quite a few of us in the audience that uh, you know, may have just been starting out. And this book, Publishing with iBooks Author, is available in the iBooks store by O'Reilly. Um, it's kind of the soup to nuts, uh, what you need to know from the outset about, like, just the basic interface and things like that. I'll say that if you're familiar with things like Keynote, this, this program is surprisingly similar to Keynote and the look and feel and the way some of the interfaces uh, work. So some of you, once you get in and start experimenting, you'll just be flying. But for those of you who need more help, this book is a great resource. Also, I have the Michigan State Annual Report up there. That was just something that sparked our, it was inspiring to us at the beginning when we were deciding what to do, uh, how to approach this. and. Uh, so those of you who are interested, check out the Michigan State Report. Also, check out the Made with iBooks Authors section in the uh, iBook Store, and that's at the bottom of the page under the quick links. That when you get into iTunes or into iBooks, rather, there's the quick links at the very bottom that say one of them says Made with iBooks Author. And to connect with us anytime, uh, ac.edu/learningstudio. That's our blog. You can follow our uh, latest news and events and uh, featured projects and updates and stay current. There's actually, um, we're on Twitter. We're always tweeting things that inspire us and uh, interest us. So check us out there. And on Vimeo.com slash learning studio, you can see all of our video projects as we release them to the worldwide web.